Coast believers, I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord today. Good to see you all this morning. Um, hey, we're going to get right to work and get in this series. We're called, it's called just the New Testament book of wisdom. We need wisdom for the day and the age that we live in. I think we can all feel it. Our nation is divided. Even homes are divided. If you were to do the research and see the research that I see, you would understand that our nation is in crisis right now. Mental health, there's a mental health crisis going on with the younger generation. We see consumer debt at an all-time high. We see families struggling. And I mean, we could just use some wisdom. But not just any wisdom, but wisdom from God's Word. What does God say about the age we're living in? See, if you were to take your Bible, there's 66 books, an Old Testament and a New Testament. It's 41 different authors written in three different languages over about 1,800 years. In the Old Testament, there's, called five, there's five books called the books of wisdom. You have Job, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and then Psalms. And then, but in the New Testament, there's this one book. They call it the New Testament book of wisdom. It's the book of James. And what makes James so unique is that he speaks right to where we are. He's challenging, challenging you not just to believe in something, not just to get a ticket into heaven and avoid hell. He's challenging you to live a life that represents your faith. He's challenging you to live a life that's just, and, and in a snapshot in five chapters, and if you were to read, it takes you about 10 minutes. He's challenging you to live differently. And he's saying, hey, I need your faith not just to be a theological deal. I need it to be more than theoretical. I need for your faith to show up in your everyday. Last week, we, talked, we, we took the first half of James chapter 1. We talked about tests and trials and temptations. If you weren't here, that, that message is available on our website. It's available to you free on YouTube. Go back and watch it, how to manage temptations that come to you in life. Today I want to get right into this because in the second, cha- second half of chapter 1, James picks up on a verse that we read last week and he introduces a new thought. And for some would say, this is sort of the whole gist, this message today, this is the whole gist of James. And he said in James chapter 1 and verse 16, he said, everybody, don't be misled. And in other words, our, the King James says, don't be deceived. In other words, it would be easy. He said, it's possible for you to be a Christian and be misled or be deceived. He said, my dear brothers and sisters, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. Here's what he's telling you. Don't be misled. Maybe through your journey of life, you've you've gone through some things and you felt like something bad's happened to you in your life. God was the author of it. James said this, don't be deceived. Don't be misled. If anything bad ever happened to you in your life, God did not author it. He can use it. He can help you through it. But if anything bad's ever happened to you in your life, it came from a poor choice or you have an enemy in this world. You see, he said, hey, don't be misled. Don't be deceived. Maybe you thought, well, maybe I just open the door and God's just doing that. No, if it's bad, it's not from God. If it's good, it's not from the devil. Last week we talked about it. He'll bait it and make it look like it's good. But then he said, hey, who created all the lights in the heavens, he never changes or casts a shift in shadow. I love this verse. Because you know what it means? I might, make, I might wake up in a bad mood, but God never wakes up in a bad mood. I like that. He just never changes. No matter how much we change, he's the same. He chose to give birth to us. He's talking about a salvation experience by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. Caleb mentioned that earlier and a moment ago about us being his prized possession. I love this. Maybe you don't know this about God. Maybe you, don't know, maybe you don't think this about God because you see yourself and all your flaws. But he has said this, when you became born again, when you said yes to Jesus, see, you got more than just a ticket to heaven. You became a new creature in Christ. Old things passed away. God said you became his prized possession. In other words, you're what's on his mind. Now, if you have a you, you might have a prized possession in your life. It could be a vehicle. It could be the home that you live in. It could be jewelry. And if you're a family and you've come to find this out when you get to be my age, that the most important things in life are relationships. The most important things in life are people. You have prized possessions. Those are the people in your life, as the, the family, your children, whatever that would be. It's really important to you. And God said, hey, the Bible says God is absolutely crazy 
about you. But if you have a pro, if you have children, you could love them, you could care deeply about them, but you love them so much that you're not willing to let them take the wrong path in life. You love them so much that you want to guide them. You love them so much that you're not willing to let them just keep making poor choices without confronting it. The Bible says this, he gave birth to us. What does that mean? Here's what this means, is when you said yes to Jesus, your spiritual DNA changed. See, a lot of us are trying to serve God out of discipline. A lot of us are trying to serve God out of duty. A lot of us are trying to serve God out of getting our behavior right. And, and it's good to get your behavior right. But I need to let you know something. God is not into behavior modification. He's into spiritual transformation. God doesn't change you from the outside in. If I can just get my thoughts right and get my behavior right, and then honestly on the inside I'll be okay. No, he said, hey, I'm going to change you from the inside, and it's going to show up on the outside. So now if you were to read this, though, he makes that clear. that He gave you a new birth experience, and you became his prized possession. But now we got to read the rest of this. And now James is going to bring some wisdom to that thought. Hey, now that you're a believer, now that you're a follower of Jesus, he picks up in verse 19, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. So he's talking to the church. He said, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak. In our generation, we'd say slow to type. Slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and the evil in your lives. And humbly accept, we're going to come back to this in the last minute of this message, humbly accept the word God has planted in your heart. When you got saved, he did something inside of you. It has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. And this is probably, a lot of theologians would say, this is the gist of the book of James, this verse. Others would say differently. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself. So in here, you see what could be. You're hearing a message, and you go, well, I'm inspired this, I could have a marriage like this. I could have a family like this. I could get my finances in order like this. I could have a relationship with God like this. But if you don't do it, you walk away and you forget what could be, what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law, the Word of God, that sets you free. I know so many people want freedom. And I know, listen, I get it. I, lo I love prayer. And I love the miracles of God. And a lot of us want instant miracles. And God will work them. But he has a better thing than a miracle in your life. He has something called the Word of God, the principles of the Word of God, where you sow and you reap. Yeah. And miracles are good, but miracles by, na by design, are th they're to come in and fix something out of the ordinary. But God has a better life than just miracle, from miracle to miracle. He says, hey, if you live according to my Word, you could be free. And if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will, here it is, bless you, for doing it. Bless you for being a doer. I read this verse in verse 26, and this is one of those verses like, God, why? I wish this wasn't in the Bible. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself. Don't you wish that wasn't in the Bible? I mean, I do. Gosh, almost daily I wish that wasn't in the Bible. He says, hey, if you claim to have a heart for the things of God, but you can't get your words under control, and you're going to get in a fight all the time and be a keyboard warrior. You're only fooling, fooling yourself. This is the Bible, not me. I told you James doesn't mess around. He says your religion is useless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for the orphans. Thank you for caring for the orphans East Coast. And widows, thank you for being so generous because you do this every day, every week. And they're distressed in refusing to let the world corrupt you. James lays out in this 10 verses. He says, hey, you get to choose how to live your life. It's up to you how you want to live your life. He said, here's, here's your choice. You can do it my way. You can do it, well, hey, I want to live my life according to how I want to live my life. And, and that's fine. That's your choice. You can live it the world's way. You can live it the way the world says is their standard. Or he says, you can live it God's way. 
Really, the choice is up to you. If you can live it your way, the world's way, or God's way. But here's what he's saying. If you're going to live it God's way, and I think this is where a lot of us really want to be. That's why you're here this morning. He said, here's what's going to have to happen. You're going to hear the word of God. You're going to have to hear the word of God. But you're going to be confronted with the choice. Once you read something in the Bible, once you hear someone say something that comes out of the Bible, God's thoughts, God's idea, you're going to have a choice. Are you going to hear it? And are you going to apply it or not apply it? He said, if you hear the word or read the word and do not apply it, he just simply says, you're deceived. You just don't even know it. Years ago, I remember we were... We used to have SeaWorld passes. I don't even know why. Our kids were much younger then. And so we, Dina would take them over there, and I'd go over there every so often, go to the SeaWorld. And you ever remember the old show? I don't know if they still have it the way they do it now. Things have changed. But remember the Shamu show? And uh, Shamu would come out and, and all this. And, you, and so, I mean, if you're a Floridian, you know this. There's something down below called the splash zone. And you don't want to sit in the splash zone. Yeah. We have a prayer team available for you after. <laughs> and so, you, but if you're going to sit in that splash zone, you've got to be prepared. But, you know, if you get there on timing, you get seats, and then you see these tourists coming in. At the last minute, they're running, and they see these seats there. And it says splash zone. They don't know what that means. And you see them all sit down, families, and you know they don't understand what's getting ready to happen because they got the phones out and the cameras out, and, and they're just, they don't have any, you know, poncho, none, no rain gear, none of that sort. They're just sitting there. And you're thinking, here it comes. You don't know what's getting ready to happen. You just don't know what the splash zone means. And what James is trying to talk to you about here, if you hear the Word of God and you don't apply it, you're deceived. You don't know what's coming. You've, and that's the problem with deception. By definition, deception means you don't know. And he's trying to bring light to it. So in verse 25, he says, but hey, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this and not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. He said, hey, there's power in doing the word. There's not power in hearing the word. There's power in the Bible says something, God said something, and I'm going to do it. And I choose to do what the Bible asked me to do. Dean and I were just reflecting a few weeks ago. We went away for a few days and reflected on our, we were reflecting on our 30 years of marriage. And we talked about the good times and the bad times. And we brought up an event that had happened with some relationships and and she said, how did, you, how did you do that? And I said, well, I didn't want to forgive. I didn't want to forgive, but my, my faith required it of me. My faith, God asks me to do it. And if I will do that, I will be blessed. And here's what he's saying. If you listen to the word only, and you don't apply action to the word, you're spiritually out of shape. It's almost like you're taking in without putting anything out. Now, it, if you, if you love geography and you love, you know, the Middle East, you know, some of the, Israel in particular, you know there's a, there's a body of water over there called the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is unique, and it's in the Jordan Rift Valley, and, and it, bo it borders Palestine, Jordan, and Israel, the Dead Sea. And what makes it so, people go in there all the time, what makes it unique is that water comes in, but there's no place for the water to come out. And so the only way the water gets out of there is by evaporation, and it leaves all the salt and all the minerals in there. In fact, people, it's so, it's so buoyant, you can go there and float without, a, without having any device around you. You can just float in the water without, without a life jacket or anything because it's so, so much water in it. And what they'll say is nothing can live in it. And here's the reason nothing can live, because all it does is take in. It never has an opportunity, opportunity to let out. And a lot of us are wondering, like, why are we not experiencing God's highest in his best? It's because all we're doing is taking in without doing anything with what God has shared with us. And that's what James is trying to communicate here. Jesus would say it like this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, and that's where a lot of, honestly, Christians are today. We hear the word. He said, but you have to put them into practice. If you do, you're a wise man. A wise person 
who built his house on the rock. Because you know why? The rains come. The streams rose. And the winds blew and beat against that house. Here's what I want you to know. I can't. I wish I could pray that you would never have a storm in your life. I, 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 if I could, I'd do it for you. I can't ha- tell you and teach you how to never have a storm in your life, but I can teach you and tell you how to survive a storm that comes in your life. And he said, hey, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. And the foundation on the rock is not being a member of a church. It's not having a Bible. It's not reading your Bible. Jesus said the foundation on the rock is when you hear it and then you do it. And that's what James is trying to accomplish in this first part of this, second part of this first chapter. Now, I've been thinking about this. Why would people, why would people not, why do people not put value on God's word like we should today? I was was thinking, if you go back to the very first time in the Bible that your enemy was mentioned, the New Testament calls him the adversary of your soul. The Bible calls him Lucifer. He calls him Satan. Whether you believe in there's a devil or not, does it, it makes no difference. There is one. Remember when you had little kids, you'd play hide and seek with them, and they would cover their eyes? And, they, and because they couldn't see you, they thought you couldn't see them? And there's a lot of us today that are covering our eyes, thinking there's no such thing as an enemy in your life. Well, I need to let you know something. Heaven and hell are real places. God's real. The enemy's real. Okay? And, and, and when, why do we not value God's word? Well, when Satan showed up, he did something. On the very first scene, he shows up. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. He said to the woman, did God really say? Isn't that the message of our culture today? Did God really say that? Did God say he created them male and female? Did God say you're a wonderful, wonderfully and fearfully made in, in, the, in, in, the, in your mother's womb? Did God say you should honor the Lord with your wealth? Did God say pray for them which despitefully use you? Did, and that's, that's the thing we have today is did God say? And there's no place that the enemy in your life won't work really, really hard to get you to question did God mean what he say, said? And he'll get you to question it over and over and over again. The second thing he'll get you to do is, well, you believe he said it, but then you don't really have to do it. It doesn't apply to you. It's almost like we approach the word of God and the commands of God as a preference in our life. Well, it's just a preference. Here's what I want you to know. If it is a preference, this is what James said. Don't be upset with me. He said, if the Bible is a preference to you, the word of God is, well, I'll, I'll do this part, but I don't want to do this part, and I believe this, and I don't believe that. He said, you're just simply fooling yourself. You, you, you don't mean to, but you're fooling yourself. The King James says you're, you're just deceived. If you listen to God's word and treat it like it's just a preference in your life, here's what I need to let you know. Bible ideas are not good ideas. They're God's law. They're God's principles. They're God's word. And he's trying to say, hey, base your life on this. You'll be glad that you did. In 1517, there was a a monk by the name of Martin Luther. And he showed up on the scene. And at the time he showed up on the scene, the church was in big trouble. The organized religion of the day, they they were doing something called selling indulgences. And they were selling the favor of God. They were selling the forgiveness of God. And Martin Luther started, he opened his Bible and he started reading his Bible. He he just thought he was going to challenge the establishment. And he was like, how do you have the audacity to sell God's grace and God's mercy? So he did something. There was a church in Wittenberg, Germany. He went and he posted on the church 95 theses on, on the door. And it, it ignited. And honestly, we're here today because of his, the way he just busted out of religion then. And then ignited the Protestant Reformation that we are walking in the benefit of that today. And, I'm, and I've read that story so many times. I, thought, I think to myself, I wonder if he knew. Because I don't think he did. I wonder if he knew the ripples he was going to cause. And 500 years later, 
there would be a church in Oviedo, Florida that would benefit from, from what he did. I wonder if he knew that he, he was making history. I don't think he knew he was making history. Because one of Martin Luther's famous quotes, if you go to the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C., if you haven't, I just highly recommend you do. And one of the quotes in there is this. He said, my conscience is taken captive by God's word. He said, the Bible, it affects how I live. The Bible, it affects how I do life. The Bible affects how I function on, on this earth. So the question is this. How do you respond to all this? In the next 18 minutes, I want to help you switch from being just a hearer of the word to being a doer of the word. I want, I want to get you to a place where you give God's word the proper place in your life, where you honor it. And James is almost saying, hey, that's where the power is. That's where the blessing is. He said, if you do this, you're going to be blessed. If you don't do this, you won't be blessed. And, and, and you could do the Bible in some parts of your life and be blessed. And in other parts, you choose not to, and you're not blessed for it. And you're wondering, why, why isn't all the blessing of God coming in my life? Well, here's what he's saying. With conviction comes power. With doing comes blessing. And so I want to take you to a parable. I was thinking about how. How can I communicate this truth? I want to take you to a parable. And it starts off more than a parable. It starts off as a story. And it's going to be found in, in Luke chapter 14. And in Luke chapter 14, Jesus is having dinner. He's eating with people. And, and all of these people, because he's becoming pretty well known. He's becoming somewhat famous by, by now. And he's, he's having dinner and people are fighting to sit next to him. They want to sit next to the person at the place of honor, you know, at the dinner, at the banquet. And that's where we get the famous line in the scripture where Jesus says, the humble shall be exalted and the exalted shall be humbled. He said, hey, don't put yourself in a place of honor. Let God put you in a place of honor. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. He said, the greatest among you is going to be the one who serves all. And that's for all that. That's all in this chapter. Well, now, if you go down to verse 15, we're going to pick up right before the parable. Hearing this, the man heard all that stuff about the humble shall be exalted, the exalted shall be humbled. He said, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. Now, for a lot of you, when you read that, and they thought the same thing at that time, the kingdom of God was a place. The kingdom of God would be like heaven. The kingdom of God would be a new kingdom that Jesus would establish. But we'll find out in Scripture that the kingdom of God is not a place. The kingdom of God is not a location. The kingdom of God is a system. It's a way of living your life. It's a way of doing things. And so when you read your Bible and you see the phrase, Jesus used kingdom of God, he wasn't talking about heaven. He wasn't talking about a physical location, a geographical place. He was talking about a system, a way of managing your life, a way of doing things. And then he says to these guys, he replied with them a story. He's going to tell them a parable. And here's the parable. A man prepared a great feast. And sent out many invitations. And when the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guest, Come, the bank, remember this, the banquet is ready. It's ready now. But they all began to make excuses. Remember that. One said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, Go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and invite, remember this, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, There is still room for more. So his master said, Go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. There's three thoughts that I want to give you from here that he said. When it comes to operating in the kingdom of God, his system. If you want to find yourself in it, function and right in his system, the first thing he said about if you want to operate and function in this, he said, if you want to be a doer of the word and how to do it, he says, make a decision that, first of all, now is the time. Well, one day I'm going to apply these truths to my life. And he's just simply saying, is we have to say, now is the time. And, and the question is simple. What in God's word that he's asked you to do, that you're just not willing to do, that needs to be addressed. We, for 
it's hard to believe Dina sent me a, a little screenshot this week, but it was 20 years ago this week or last week that Hurricane Charlie hit. And I remember we just had moved here, and I had, I had grown up in Port Orange, and, and uh, we had, I had been gone about 12, 13 years. And Dean, of course, grew up in Pennsylvania, and, and, and we were living in Oklahoma at the time. We moved here to plant East Coast. And so we were here, that was in February. Well, come, here comes August, Hurricane Charlie. And she says, well, what do we need to do? I said, oh, we don't do anything about hurricanes in Orlando. <laughs> That's just for the coast. She said, are you sure? Everyone's getting water and gas. I said, they, they're transplants. They've never lived here before. <laughs> if you li- I, I'm, I'm a native Floridian. Hurricanes aren't a big deal to us. Well, you wonder how we made it 30 years, don't you? All I know is this. We're inside the house in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock in the morning, and it felt like the roof was coming off, and all of a sudden we heard over the radio, now is the time to take cover. And I had our youth pastor at the time. He was from Pennsylvania, too. He's outside. He's outside wanting to see a hurricane. <laughs> he came inside. I'm not making this up. With a cut on his head, a shingle hit him in the head. And here's what it is. Now is the time to take cover. And what Jesus is saying, there's no better time than na- when you hear a truth and when God speaks the truth to you and you hear something in a message, now is the time to put it into practice in your life. That's just the reality. Now is the time. We were, we were in Alabama, uh, uh, Dean and I, and we brought some of our team with us for a meeting, and we had about eight of us there. We're having dinner one night after meetings, and, and, um, and it was late, and I'm not much of a late night eater, and, and so we were at this restaurant, and, and, and lo and behold, another pastor couple that we had known from Iowa we're over on the other side of the restaurant eating, and, and so I started telling our staff, some of the staff I was with us, you know how they got married? One night we were out playing putt-putt golf way back in the late 80s, early 90s. We were playing putt-putt. Dean and I, who just, it was actually uh, 1993, rather, 94, and we just got married, and, and so we're playing putt-putt. They were dating, and Bill leans over to me. He goes, well, how do you know? This is the story I'm telling our staff. They go, how do you know you're supposed to get married to the one you got married to? And I just responded to him. I was just flippantly said, well, if the light's not red, then I guess it's green. I didn't think anything about it. He asked her to marry him that night. He asked her to marry him. When I heard that, I was like, oh, no. (laughs) But here they are 30 years later, pastor in Iowa. Here's what I'm saying. Sometimes the time is now. And there's no better time than now. And this is why the Bible says in Hebrews 12, I love this. He said, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses to the life of faith. Like if you have someone that, who stepped into eternity, you, you have a lot invested into heaven. And I get that. I have a dear friend that went to heaven this week. And here's what the Bible says. They're cheering you on right now. They get to see it. What's going on in your life. Let us strip. He said, now's the time. Strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before this, before us. He simply said, hey, now is the time to quit messing around. He said, how do you do this? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. And what I love about about this, because if you've ever been hurt by someone in the church. It's so easy. I hear people say, well, I, I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. It's like saying, hey, Norm, I love you, but your bride's ugly. I don't want to go anything with her. The Bible calls the, the church the bride of Christ. If we love the groom, then we love the bride. It's a package deal. But if someone ever hurts you in the church, can I tell you this? They hurt you. The church didn't hurt you. They're the ones that hurt you. But one of the things I have found that will help you keep your eyes on Jesus is being surrounded by the right people. Make sure you have the right people in your life. Make sure you have the the people. It's like that that man that was paralyzed 
and remember he had four friends and it went up to the roof and tore the roof apart and lowered the cot in the middle of Jesus. You got to find four friends that are willing to rip a roof, rip a roof apart to get you close to Jesus. That's why it's so important. That's why I just want to let you know that today our fall, our fall small group season is launching. Our soft launch is right now. Next week will be the official launch. What I'm saying to you is the, the, the small groups have opened up online only. You have 130 or so to choose from. Find one that you can do life with people. Find one that you can just be a part of. If you were saying, well, I don't know what group to go to, what I would do, I'd start off with get into a freedom group. Now, here's why I'm telling you that. All of them. There's, there's 130 different small groups that you could choose from. There, a lot of them are going to fill up real quickly. The freedom ones will probably be filled up by the end of today. So find, find a route that you can pl- plug into. But then, well, what's next in this story? Jesus said, it's, when it comes to doing the word, do it now. Don't make a decision, I'll do it a few days later. He said, do it now. But then in verse 18, he said, but they all began making excuses. Here's what Jesus is saying. When it comes to being a doer of the word, remember that I am not the exception. That I'm not the exception. All of us have a reason why we're the exception. All of us have a reason why we shouldn't do the Bible. All of us have a reason why it wouldn't work for us. All of us have the reason why, well, if you knew my mother-in-law, if you knew my father-in-law, if you knew who my kids chose to marry, if you knew my neighbors, all of us, if you knew my schedule, if you knew my life, you would understand. And you can go all through the Bible and you could find there are people that have reasons why they shouldn't do it. Moses well, I'm a stutterer. I can't lead people. Moses said, hey, I've made so many mistakes in my life. God couldn't use me. Sarah, I can't have a baby. You see how old I am, God? You, Peter, I mean, Jesus, you're going to use me. I denied you. I'm the one you're always correcting. I'm the one that's always on your radar to fix. And they all, Paul, I'm a murderer. Why do you want to use me? And here's what, we have to do the word now and remember that you're not the exception to what the principles in God's word. And then the story goes on in verse 21. He said, hey, go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town. And invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And when I start reading that, I think, who's he talking about here? Desperate people. And here's sometimes we have to get to the point where we have to get desperate. We have to get to a place in our life where we're going to say, God, I have to live according to your principle. I have to move beyond just getting to heaven. I have to get desperate. I have to say, God... Your principles, your commands, your words are not incremental additions to my life, but they are my life. He said, if you, if you want to be blessed. And then the story goes on in verse 23. He said, so his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone. I want you to see the urgency here. Urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. He, he's speaking of eternity. He's talking about people that, man, if they don't get to God, their eternity is going to be ruined. And here's what he's saying. I need you to remember something. And you've heard this probably five different times in messages this year, because it is something that God has asked me to remind you of. And you're going to hear it over and over and over again this year. You need to remember, because the world will lie to you and say, this is all there is. You need to remember that you will live for eternity. That you're going to live forever. And, And remember, the decisions that you make today, are all they are is preparation for what you're going to do in eternity. You remember you're a citizen of heaven. And here's what he's saying. Start divesting in things that have no eternal value. They're okay to have in your life, but make sure you're investing in some things that have eternal value. In other words, stop selling God short. 35 years ago. My buddy over here, Jeff Sterling, and me, we're living roommates and going to college together. And we didn't live for the Lord. We didn't serve the Lord, either one of us. 
In fact, we were talking the other day, and one of, one of the nightmares I had when God asked me to pastor back in Oviedo was this. I hope there's no one that I knew in college that would ever come back to our church, would come to our church, because they might be upset. We didn't live, for, we did our best to live for the world and for the devil, and we did it well. But 35 years ago, on a Thursday night, after a night of drinking, and you guys will remember this, nickel beer and 25 cent oysters. It's amazing. We eat those 25 cent oysters, we're still alive today. We ate them. I came home, it's probably midnight, one, two o'clock in the morning. And I got on my knees and I said, Jesus, if you would take this broken down sinner, I'll live the rest of my life for you. You'll never find a person that'll live for you more and do more for you than me, if you would take me. And all I was trying to do was get rid of the guilt in my life. I just carried guilt everywhere I went because I knew better. And man, I could, in a moment like that, God, I said, I surrendered. He said yes to me. But I did something that I thought everybody did. I truly thought everyone who said yes to Jesus did this. I went all in. I went all in. If, if God said it in his word, that I was going to do it. If God said it, Okay, that settled it for me. Like I was an all-in Christian. And I thought everybody did that. But I found out many years later in pastoring that not everyone does that. And I can tell you 35 years later, the return on my life for saying not just yes to Jesus to get to heaven, but say yes to Jesus, I want to do it your way and not my way. The return I can't even put it into words to you today. The return on my life. How good God has been to me to serve Him. My advice is don't raise your hand and pray a prayer. My advice is raise your hand, pray a prayer of surrender and say, God, you're in control of my life now. That's what James was saying. Be a doer. So we're going back to this verse. Two minutes. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone, no one's exempt, should be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires therefore get rid of all moral filth like don't do it the world's way and the evil that is so prevalent in the culture today at least it didn't do something and this is the message today it's simple humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you fill in the blank. Your finances, your marriage, your joy, your family, your relationships, whatever area that you got in. He said, this, this Bible, it has the power. If you'll accept it and give it the proper place in your life and not just read it, not just hear it, not just listen to it, but do it, it can save all arenas of your life. That's the Bible. One last verse and we'll be done here. If I were to sum up today's message, it's just simple. Because we all want spiritual maturity. We all want it. We all want to be mature spiritually. None of us are serving God and don't want to grow. We all do. And I'm, I work very, very hard to get you to grow. And I've, we've laid out, we work so hard to put stuff in a line for you so you, if you'll just do it, you'll grow. But real spiritual, spiritual maturity, I was thinking about it, real spiritual maturity is this, that I want God to tell me how to live. It's not, I have to, I want God to speak into my life. I want God to have the final say. There's a chapter in the Bible, it's the longest chapter in the Bible, and it's Psalms 119. And it's interesting, that chapter is a, a chapter about the Bible, about the Word of God. If you want to have a great read, go read it. You'll enjoy it, especially after today's message. But I love this verse in the message. He said, oh, that my steps might be steady, keeping to the course you set, and then I'd never have any regrets. But wouldn't that be the life that you'd want, to have no regrets? 
and comparing my life with your counsel. I thank you for speaking straight from your heart. I learned the pattern of your righteous ways. Here it is. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. Don't ever walk off and leave me. Let that be our prayer today. I'm going to do what God asked me to do in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for every person here today. Lord, I thank you for their lives. Lord, today we're... James did what James did. He, can, he challenged us. He confronted us with a, a proverb, a new, some New Testament wisdom. And the proverb is simple. To be a hearer is not good enough. We have to be a hearer and a doer. So, Father, if there's any area of our life we've been holding back from you, we haven't been doing, Lord, I'm asking you to reveal that to us right now. Lord, as I walked through this auditorium this morning and prayed for these seats, I prayed for these cheers, Lord. But what I wanted was blessing. What I wanted was people to be blessed in their life. But Lord, I know that you're not withholding blessing. The blessing comes from being a doer of the word. So Holy Spirit, in a moment like this, if there's an area of our life that we're not being a doer in, would you speak to us, Lord? And we want to adjust that. We don't want to be deceived, Lord. We don't want to fool ourselves any longer. But Lord, today, our prayer is simple. Speak, Lord, your servant listens. And then we're going to say yes to what you ask of us. Just in this super holy moment, just let God speak to you.